Welcome back. Let's now start with the second discipline of our chapter, that is the fundamental concepts. As you can see here, there are goals of myocardial protection. The first initial goal was to stop the heart, to create a bloodless still feed in order to be having better access and be able to address the pathologies at a better level. In order to do that, you will obviously stop the electromechanical action of the heart, which will comprise heart being ischemic. So the rest of the body will be deprived of blood. We overcome that by bypass machine. However, what happens to the heart itself? The first initial solution proposed was um, uh, cardioplegia, that is reducing the oxygen requirement of the heart in order to achieve an equilibrium state at which, yes, you are reducing oxygen to apply, but on the other hand, you're reducing oxygen demand, so you receive uh, an equilibrium state, hence, um, uh, which is reversible at the end of the operation. You can reverse that and the heart recovers again. So this was the initial aim, that is, uh, um, uh, achieving a bloodless still feed. Second and the third aims were automatically raised, that is, you need to protect the heart from the ischemic effects. Yes, you are reducing oxygen supply, so you need to protect the heart from these effects. Second is, after you finish, after you reperfuse everything, you need to uh, protect the heart from the effects of that. So every goal on every aim of myocardial protection could be traced back to one of the fundamental concepts which we'll be discussing now. I will not go into details into the actual potential, just to remind you in, in brief, the sinoatrial node has innate electrical activity which uh, triggers at all times spontaneously. This will obviously cause um, activation of uh, my myocyte action potential that goes into a cascade of events um, for uh, the four stages of uh, action potential and later triggers um, a subsequent uh, myocytes and this creates the electrical activity or the electrical wave which flows through the heart this electrical wave is translated in the form of a mechanical contraction so electromechanical activity this is the basic function of the heart basic physiology of the heart how to stop this electromechanical activity how to reduce the work of the heart and hence reduce the oxygen requirement of the heart this is explained by what we call Nernest equation so um, what Nernest um, proposed is any membrane uh, uh, the resting membrane potential or uh, the uh, uh, the electrical potential of that membrane is governed by the electrical ions or um, uh, electrical charges either side of that membrane. So in our particular case, the myocyte mem cell membrane, resting membrane potential of it is governed by the ion concentration on either side. So if you alter this concentration, as you can see here, C0 and Ci, if you alter this relation between the uh, concentration outside and concentration inside you will lead to a different resting membrane potential so for um, the first proposed uh, uh, way of uh, stopping the electromechanical activity of the heart was displacing the extracellular fluid with a different concentration of fluid and hence altering the um, um, resting membrane potential. This material was called cardioplegia because it stops the heart. So what happens is, as you can see here, the if we replace potassium, that is normally four millimoles outside the heart, if you replace it with 20 millimoles potassium solution, what happens is the resting membrane potential will move from minus 90 to minus 50. Hence, the sodium channels will get inactivated. So regardless of the innate activity and continuous triggering by the sinoatrial node, the action potential will fail to proceed, will fail to progress into uh, the next stage simply because sodium channels will be inactivated. They need to be at a potential of minus 70 in order to trigger and this will not be achieved. Hence, action potential will stop, electrical activity will stop and subsequent mechanical activity, electromechanical arrest is achieved. Unfortunately, although this looks like a very clever idea, however, it came with side effects, intolerable side effects, its electromechanical activity or electromechanical arrest was abandoned for almost 20 years. Different states were investigated in order to uh, achieve this equilibrium we were talking about. We will still try to stop the heart, we will deprive the heart, we will just put a cross clamp, prevent blood from going there and yet we will need to find a different state to achieve this equilibrium, decreasing the oxygen requirement of the heart. 
other than the electromechanical errors. We will later discuss what happened uh, in the techniques in the techniques section later on, but um, uh, a very important concept we need to tackle here is the oxygen consumption. So different states were investigated by researchers in order to achieve this equilibrium alternative to uh, electromechanical errors, such as fibrillating heart, such as cold heart, hypothermia alone, such as decompressed heart. Um, all these states were investigated. However, a very crucial study in the history of myocardial protection was uh, uh, launched by uh, Gerald Buckberg and Follett uh, and colleagues. That is, they looked into how much oxygen is required at these various different states. And the conclusion was electromechanical arrest is the best state of uh, protecting the heart. It reduces the oxygen content to its least level. All the other states, yes, they reduce the oxygen requirement. However, nothing matches electromechanical arrest. This was the conclusion of the study. Hence, researchers then started going back into uh, electromechanical arrest and trying to find out why did we fail in the first instant. It is, by all means, the best physiological state during ischemia to have electromechanical arrest. Why did we fail? Why did we get these deleterious effects? One of the very first to look into that and um, um, and produced a very important concept in my cardio protection, that is uh, Hearst DJ in his book, uh, which he published in 1981, titled Protection of Ischemic Myocardium. So he um, outlined three pillars for our elements of protection, that is one, electromechanical arrest, two, hypothermia, three, which is most important, uh, is the protective additive agents. During ischemia, you are um, um, triggering a lot of whiplash effect, a lot of side effects happening. Using the cardioplegic solution itself causes a lot of uh, side effects. You need additive protective agents to counteract these. Um, from his point of view, this uh, concept was failed. Uh, to, uh, the initial attempts failed to acknowledge this um, um, particular idea and hence this led to the side effect. Uh, as you can see, some of the protective agents such as magnesium to counteract calcium load, uh, bicarb to counteract acidosis, nutrients to counteract the reduced state of nutrients and uh, energy substrates, various additive agents need to be added in order to protect the heart during the scheme. In order to completely comprehend the myocardial protection concept, you need to understand what happens during ischemia and what happens during reperfusion. So starting with ischemia, ischemic effects on the heart uh, is completely reliant on the severity as well as duration of the ischemic insult. Various durations, various severities lead to various uh, effects and produces a, a, a different picture. This creates a spectrum of uh, uh, presentations uh, depending on the severity duration of ischemia. So to start with, if you have a short mild uh, ischemic insult, this will lead to what we call ischemic preconditioning. Uh, ischemic preconditioning is actually a protective state. Think about it that way. So the heart gets enough training, gets trained how to deal with more severe ischemic conditions. This is one of the recent or fairly recent uh, concepts which was recently understood, um, um, described by Moray and colleagues in 1981. <laughs> Taking it to the first uh, a higher level, that is short uh, as well as severe uh, ischemic uh, insult, will lead to what we call myocardial stunning, or in other words, ischemia reperfusion injury. Uh, this is a post-operative phenomenon which happens and most of the time um, it recovers spontaneously. All you need is support the heart during that state. So what happens is it has a different rate. It could be mild, moderate, severe. It can take anywhere between hours, minutes. Uh, it could take up to uh, days and even weeks to recover. So what happens is the heart sustains an injury and this leads to uh, certain uh, changes which we will discuss uh, in, um, um, uh, in later slides. And this what we call myocardial uh, stunning. Revascularization has already happened. Myocardial perfusion is already fixed, however, the heart is still repairing itself due to this um, uh, ischemic insult. Why do we learn it? We learn it in order to protect the heart from it and understand it postoperatively. If you manage to perform a good myocardial protection, you will hopefully be able to avoid myocardial stunning. The third level that is prolonged, however mild, 
uh, ischemic insult will lead to hibernation. Hibernation, on the other hand, is a preoperative phenomenon. It happens in, in cases where the heart is sustaining an ischemic injury on a mild level for a long period of time, so the heart goes into adaptive state. It adopts uh, a, a, an earlier phenotype in which the heart requires less energy uh, and um, um, goes into what we call a power saving mode, if you would like to mention, uh, if you like to call it that way. So it's a power saving mode. The heart reduces its energy requirement and reduces its function. Remember, if you revascularize this heart, it will return back to normal. Why do we study it? In order to be not misled by it. Once you see a heart, a failing heart, you need to identify whether this is a permanently failed heart or a hibernating heart. If you revascularize it, do you need to revascularize it or not? If you revascularize it, will you get any benefit or not? The last stage, obviously, is myocardium necrosis. This is dead myocardium. This is the state of no value for revascularization. You need heart failure therapy, whether medical or surgical. So you don't revascularize dead myocardium because you won't get any benefit from that. This, this is the spectrum of effects of ischemia on hearts. This is in brief, in this slide we just briefly described what we just said. Uh, uh, the, there are certain perfusion uh, studies as well as PET scan studies that gives you idea what, what stage of the spectrum are you in. I will not go into that in details. Now, also the ischemic effects, a very important and uh, a very um, uh, crucial part of the ischemic response of the myocardium is the calcium hemostasis. So remember, once the heart sustains an ischemic uh, insult, um, uh, various calcium hemostasis um, uh, changes happen. One of which is of obviously during ischemia, acidosis happens, reduced energy uh, substrates, and this will, uh, will lead, as you can see here, to raised uh, intracellular sodium. So sodium um, hydrogen antiporter will, uh, will be activated by acidosis. Uh, sodium potassium pump will be deactivated by reduced energy production, and this will eventually lead to raised sodium. Raised sodium, intracellular, on the other hand, does not cause the deleterious effect. What causes the deleterious effect is sodium being replaced and being exchanged to calcium, activation of the sodium-calcium antiporter, which leads to increase of calcium intracellularly. That's what we call calcium load. Calcium now, in this uh, instant, starts to exhibit the uh, uh, damaging effects on both the cellular level, my mitochondria, and brain, all the organelles, as well as myofibril level. So it induces a state of acting, myosin um, uh, sustained contraction, which uh, eventually causes uh, damage to the myofibril. So, what happened in the initial trials to achieve electromechanical arrest, remember, electromechanical arrest is the supreme state of ischemia. You are depriving the heart, you are putting a cross clamp on, you are depriving the heart of blood completely. If you do not manage to reduce the oxygen requirement of the heart with uh, an adequate myocardial protection strategy, you are reaching the summit, the, the supreme state of ischemia, and hence you will, um, one of the effects will be calcium uh, load. Also, during uh, ischemia, you have this whiplash effects, you have acidosis, you have reduced substrates. So, again, um, if you don't um, um, uh, apply uh, sane myocardial protection techniques, you will eventually lead to the damage which was seen after the initial attempts of electromechanical arrest. Hence, calcium load is an event which happens during ischemia or inadequate myocardial protection using myocardial uh, cardioplegia solution without additive protective agents. If you use it, you will be able to counteract those effects. The other side of the calcium hemostasis spectrum is calcium paradox. So initial attempts um, after they discovered that calcium is bad, okay, let's avoid altogether calcium, let's give cardioplegia without calcium at all, but this had even worse effect that is calcium paradox. So what happens if, if you stop um, during ischemia, um, if you deprive the heart completely of calcium, a phenomenon called calcium paradox happens, but this time after reperfusion. What happens exactly is not fully understood. However, one of the very um, uh, accepted theories is what we can outline here in this uh, diagram. So calcium depletion leads to partial cell-to-cell -cell separation. Upon reperfusion, calcium replenishes and causes profound contraction on a basis of uh, uh, partially separated myocytes, which leads to structural uh, damage. This, remember, happens during reperfusion. 
Finally, last but not least, what happens during reperfusion injury? And um, we understood now what happens during ischemia. We need to understand what happens during reperfusion. So uh, the first to describe this was Jennings et al. Um, in 1960. So he noticed that 30 to 60 minutes effect of ischemia for, followed by reperfusion was comparable to um, hours on hours of ischemia alone. So there must be a mechanism which actually is more injurious to the heart um, by ischemia reperfusion than uh, the ischemia itself. And this was true actually. All the events which happen during ischemia are expressed again during reperfusion but at a worse rate. For instance, you suffer low energy substrates, low energy production during ischemia due to slow mitochondria. Mitochondria gets completely damaged during the reperfusion due to opening of MPT ports mitochondria permeability transition pores. You cannot get rid of weights during ischemia. You're importing even more wastes during uh, uh, reperfusion by oxygen-free radicals and neutrophil reactivation. Too much calcium during uh, ischemia due to calcium load. As we explained earlier, calcium paradox happens during um, um, uh, reperfusion. Also, one of the very important enzymes that is um, uh, hypodensin dehydrogenase, which gets rid of uh, hypodensin, um, uh, which is a degradation product of ATP. This enzyme gets slow during ischemia. During reperfusion, it gets damaged altogether. It gets transformed to a completely different enzyme, which even produces innate uh, oxygen-free radicals and starts producing wastes from inside the cell. So hypothensin dehydrogenase gets transformed to xanthine oxidase. Finally, cell membrane is altered during ischemia. During reperfusion, the cell membrane gets damaged due to uh, lipid peroxidation. So as you can see, these are the uh, ischemic and reperfusion uh, effects. Um, um, I will leave you now with this MCQ question before we proceed now into techniques. Now we understood what happens. What is our goal? We need to prevent, protect against ischemia, we need to protect against reperfusion injury. How will we achieve that? This is the next discipline of our chapter. Thank you very much.